I was on the way through here to Vietnam with an old friend of mine, Johnny Morrissey, and the late Liam Boyle, and we decided we'd go on a ramble, just the three of us together. I was totally taken by the city right away. Nobody knows for sure how many people there are in Bangkok, but there may be as many as 20 million people, give or take a couple of million. One of the first things you noticed about Bangkok then, and you, and you notice it now, it's very much a first world country when it comes to amenities. It was always ahead of the other Southeast Asian countries. The food is, is fantastic, and the price of food on the street, for instance, um, you'd end up paying one-fifth of what you'd pay in a European country or in America. But the thing about Thailand that really dwarfs everything else is the people. They're legendary for being friendly, being courteous, being welcoming, and it seems to be genuine. As soon as I realized I was going to be spending time in Bangkok, and using it as a hub originally for visiting various countries in Southeast Asia, and indeed in Asia in general, I purchased a condo for a ridiculously cheap price. I just sold the house at the time, and there was money lying around, so I said, well, why not buy a place instead of always staying in hotels? What I like about Bangkok is the diversity of the city. Uh, it really is it's like the League of Nations here, and great tolerance uh, among the Thais of the various visitors that end up here. I started off being a tourist when I came here first. I knew nobody, and all I went to was the tourist places, the, the various tours of the city, um, finding the river, going on boat tours. But then I got involved with the Mercy Centre, and uh, the Mercy Centre is in the slaughterhouse, the slums of Bangkok. And notorious for poverty and for drug dealing and for all sorts of nefarious activities, uh, which takes care of kids, uh, street kids. And also address the AIDS population uh, epidemic, which was, was which is quite strong at that time, going back about 18 years now. And I contacted them and, and uttered the famous three words that get you in trouble anywhere, can I help? So it's been the talk forward now and I'm very much involved in their activities um, to the degree that I can and uh, helped create a, a slum orchestra uh, where the kids played classical music and folk music and, and kind of discover, in a sense, uh, their Thai culture, their own culture, in an environment that's becoming very, very westernized. If you listen to the music, uh, the popular music here, it's strains of, of the West, and there's nothing as bad as bad Thai pop. In recent years, I've gone back to teaching political science, which I took a degree in like a thousand years ago. Uh, and I teach that at Tamasat University. It's a university that's highly regarded here. And I get to read about and learn and push myself to teach uh, new literature, which I think they say it's good to give yourself new challenges as you get older, certainly doing a bit of that. And when I'm here, I take the time off um, to try to finish writing projects. And when the phone isn't ringing all the time, it's uh, you know, it's it, conducive to, to letting the muses speak to you, so to speak. Being in Bangkok for me has always been a problem when it comes to my music. And there's nothing I like more in life than playing music. So it is one of the things that I have to accept when I'm here is that apart from an odd musician coming through, um, I'm, I'm very unlikely to get the same kind of stimulation in playing music 
that I do all the time in Ireland and in New York. My introduction to the Mercy Center was given to me by Mick and Donny Carroll. And I believe a few years ago I started um, participating in the fundraisers in New York for the Mercy Center and that's how I first got involved uh, with them. But the inspiration for the CD that I just put out for the Mercy Center uh, came from a couple friends of mine, Lindsay and Brian O'Donovan. I learned about a CD that Lindsay had produced uh, called Lullabies for Love. Um, it was to benefit an orphanage in Africa and it was just a collaboration of a bunch of artists, some of my favorite musicians actually. And about a year later I began to reach out to several of my friends under 21 who play Irish music. It's a charity CD, all of the proceeds are going to the Mercy Center and um, all the artists on the CD um, are from all over the states, Ireland, uh, Canada, and a lot of it is traditional Irish music, but there are a couple other genres on there as well. I started with classical at a very young age. Kevin Burke was the first person I ever heard playing Irish music. It was in our local library that my mom saw a poster for Kevin Burke's concert. She didn't know anything about Irish music either, um, and she just thought, hey, let's go and hear a different genre of music played on the instrument that Haley's playing. Um, and so we went, and I heard him play, and that was it. I just said to my mom, I want to play like that. So I think we got, she got me lessons a few months after that. I had picked up his How to Play Celtic Fiddle DVD and I learned all the tunes off of there. Well, Haley Richardson is, is one of our uh, top young musicians in, in America uh, and it seems that every generation, one or two or three, come out of nowhere uh, and end up playing the music at an astonishingly advanced level. And I first met Haley when she was 11. She joined us at a concert that uh, I do every year in Philadelphia. And even then I was astonished at her the word I would use, the maturity of her playing. To have her here uh, at such a young age representing our culture uh, and, and frankly that she's a woman too, because when I arrived in America there were no women playing Irish music, it just wasn't a thing to do. Uh, the place for women was in the house. Uh, and of course there's been a sea change in that attitude, uh, and both in America and in Ireland. He's obviously had a big involvement in the culture of Irish music. He's a big part of that. And obviously he's been a big inspiration for my playing as well. So it's pretty surreal to be able to play with somebody like him. The important thing to, to realize these days is that Ethnicity is not necessarily, or ethnic background, at all in, in, in establishing the credentials of, of a person uh, playing our music. Um, you, don't, you don't have to have a passport, you don't have to have a great-grandmother who was Irish. All you have to do is be willing to go on the artistic journey, and it's quite a journey. Haley Richardson is already well known in Irish music circles in America 
and uh, also starting to be in Ireland as a very accomplished young player. In fact, when you think of Haley, you don't really think of her as a young musician so much anymore. Like, it's nice that she's young, and that's kind of a novelty to that, I suppose. But really, as far as I'm concerned, it really doesn't matter. She's just a great musician. Thailand is famous for its festivals. Uh, the word for, for, as we say in Ireland, for good crack or good times is Sanuk. Uh, and uh, the good times roll here um, just about all the time. And people love to have public events, music and singing and dancing and food. Uh, they're just about part of everything important in, in Thai culture. It was also great at that festival to see the coming of age, really, of the Mercy, uh, the Mercy Centre Music and Dance Ensemble. I mean, these are kids who uh, five years ago couldn't do one thing. And there they were on stage functioning as a professional ensemble playing all the traditional instruments and some of the folk instruments and with their dancers uh, and, and putting on a show that uh, any adult organisation would be proud of, let alone a slum institution like the Mercy Centre. He had a can player around. The can is a one of the most famous instruments in Thailand, the precursor to all the freed instruments in the world. It's got a reed, uh, so when you think concertina and accordion, think back a few thousand years and you have your can leading the way. And uh, Haley was asked quite unexpectedly not only to do a solo piece, but to do a duo with a can player she'd never met before, and I doubt I'd ever played with the instrument. To be honest with you, I had no clue what I was doing, but it was great to be able to go in such a highly produced and really amazing festival and be able to share music that I love so much with other people and to also combine traditions. It's a very fun thing to do. What does the future hold in music? I think to, 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 um, to play music always with whoever comes along, to enjoy it, to learn, to be challenged, to learn new things, um, and uh, to learn new tunes. If you're a traditional Irish musician, you just can't stop yourself wanting to learn a new tune. When, when you hear a, a piece of music and you like it, you have to learn it. And it's not enough to look at it on the page and know that it's in that book or that book. It has to become part of you.
not only is the beautiful music honed over the centuries by countless people and passed on, improved, varied, um, lovingly by, by you know, generations of people, but the playing of it is a social act which um, it links people now all over the world. I learned that you remember that man who came the last night of the tour, a lovely man called Michael O'Brien yeah. and his wife. I learned that from him about 20 years ago. The size of the crowd doesn't matter. It's the fact that you're doing it socially, with people. Um, what did Frank Hart used to say? All songs are living ghosts and long for a living voice. Well, it's that with the music too. It doesn't exist unless it's, unless it's played. My favorite part of being able to play this music is to share it with other people and form relationships with other people through the music. And I think in any tradition, any genre of music, the learners have a great duty to preserve the tradition of the music while still adding their own little twists and turns to it so that when the next generation comes along and is beginning to learn the music that they can pass on the tradition. We're very fortunate now for the first time to have an Irish ambassador in Bangkok. Oh. Up to re relatively recently, most Thai people thought that Ireland was Iceland and um, caused some complications in, in the mail too, from my end of it. But uh, Brendan Rogers, the Irish ambassador, he arrived two years ago. And it was so nice the other night to be invited to play traditional music with young Haley Richardson. It, it was just a, a lovely thing to do. And, and, and gives great importance symbolically to the music that has been ignored really uh, in so many circles um, or taken for granted or certainly not celebrated. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and privilege for us to have Mick and Haley here tonight. Uh, we're going to play us a few tunes. This is some of the best you can hear in the world. Did you say so, brother? That's what. <laughs> um, a sound from Hinnaskillum. You lovers all so great and small that dwell in Ireland, and I hope you'll pay attention while I my pen command. It was my father's anger that drove my love away, but I'm still. In my lifetime I've seen a big change in the way that traditional Irish music and singing 
has been used to symbolize the country. The Department of Foreign Affairs, when I arrived in America, they didn't pay reference to Irish traditional music at all. Uh, it wasn't on their radar. Um, not considered something all that important in representing the nation abroad. And now there's been a sea change with the, the huge revival of interest in Irish traditional music at home and abroad. Here in, in Bangkok, it's, it's wonderful to see Brendan Rogers uh, acknowledge that. And indeed the whole DFA, the Department of Foreign Affairs, they now know that we're known best around the world for our arts, for our theatre, for our literature, uh, for our music, for our dancing. And it's like our calling card, it's, this is who we are. I can't imagine what my life would be like having not played Irish music at all. I hope I just get to continue playing and um, sharing what I love with other people and hope they love it too. Music, in a sense it means everything. Everything in my life has been defined by it. And I think if you're an artist for the motivations of just making art, I think that eventually becomes who you are. On my tombstone, if I have a tombstone, it'll say Maloney Banjo Driver. It won't say Maloney College Professor uh, or anything like that.